This morning, we're going to tie up this summer series on anger. And next week, we're going to start looking at the parables Jesus offered in the Gospel of Mark. And you know, it's interesting. I think my calendar sort of summed up the real problem with anger in these pictures for yesterday and today. You see, since we adopted Coco Chanel into the Rudiger family, Debbie has given me a dog calendar every Christmas. You know, it, it seems like the right thing to do. And each day there's a picture of, the, of a dog. And then some interesting fact about our canine friends, or, or sometimes about the dog itself. Except that is on weekends. On weekends, there are two pictures of dogs, one for Saturday and one for Sunday, but both have the same theme. And even though I'm not quite sure why the publisher picked these two for the last weekend of August, I'm glad he did. Because I think anger is one of the most powerful and enticing distractions the devil can throw at us. In fact, it's one I'm embarrassed to admit I fell for this last week. You see, anger can not only distract us from our relationship with God and others, it can also cause us to lose sight of the big picture and what we really want to accomplish. In short, losing it can really cause us to, well, lose it. And for that reason, I think it's important for us to figure out how we might better manage our anger. And just like we talked about over the last nine weeks, when we're mad, it makes sense to, one, think before we speak. Two, once we're calm, express our anger. Three, get some exercise. Four, take a time out. Five, identify possible solutions. Six, stick with I statements. Seven, don't hold a grudge. Eight, use humor to release tension. And nine, practice relaxation skills. Now, I firmly believe that doing some or maybe all of these things will help us when we're angry. Of course, if doing this stuff was 100% effective, then we could have finished last week. But I hope everyone knows that's not always true. I mean, even if we convert those nine imperatives into a checklist, sometimes the hurt or the disappointment or the pain or the frustration that underpins the anger is just so great, well, it's really hard to let it go. In other words, we might need some help. Now, this really shouldn't come as any great surprise, though. My gosh, there are plenty of situations in life when we're faced with something that's so disruptive or so disturbing that we just need help. And this includes everything from a neighbor who, who built a fence on our property or a mole on our shoulder that's changed color to a huge spider in our bathtub or, well, maybe a, a skunk running around in our basement. But regardless of the reason, sometimes we might need to find some help to manage our anger. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. First, when might we need help? And second, who might be the best in providing the help we need? And so that's what we're going to be doing for the next, oh, 10, 12 minutes or so. And as it relates to the first question, when might we need help, in my opinion, there are two telltale signs. Of course, having said that, I'm assuming we've already tried doing the nine things we've already discussed. You see, if we've done the best we could with what we had, but we're still stuck in the past, that may be a sign that we need a little help, you know, a little shove. In other words, no matter what we do, no matter what we do, the hurt just won't go away. It just won't. The disappointment lingers, and we continue to feel the emotional pain every time we think about the person or the situation that's made us mad. And if that's, and if all that is still around, and it's feeding our anger, we might need some help to break the cycle. Because I'll tell you, this is not the way God wants us to live. I mean, just listen to what the prophet Isaiah wrote. Forget what happened long ago. Don't think about the past. I am creating something new. There it is. Do you see it? 
I have put roads in deserts, streams in thirsty lands. Every wild animal honors me, even jackals and owls. I provide water in deserts, streams in thirsty lands for my chosen people. I made them my own nation so they, they could praise me. Now that's what the prophet wrote. God is creating something new. And I'll tell you, that's exactly what we believe that Jesus did for us when he died on the cross. He created something new because he freed us from our past. And I think that's what Paul had in mind when he wrote. Anyone who belongs to Christ is a new person. The past is forgotten and everything is new. God has done it all. He sent Christ to make peace between himself and us, and he has given us the work of making peace between himself and others. And so if anger is, anchored, is anchoring us to the one thing we have absolutely no power to change, we might need some help. That's one sign. And two, we might want to consider talking with someone else if our anger is preventing us from growing into the people God has created us to be. You see, regardless of how we want to see ourselves, you know, the way we want to think about who we are, man, we are a work in progress. In fact, this kind of growth was, was what the Old Testament book of Proverbs was all about. Just listen to how it begins. These are the Proverbs of King Solomon of Israel, the son of David. Proverbs will teach you wisdom and self-control and how to understand sayings with deep meanings. You will learn what is right and honest and fair. From these, an ordinary person can learn to be smart. And young people can gain knowledge and good sense. If you are already wise, you will become even wiser. If you are smart, you will learn to understand proverbs and sayings, as well as words of wisdom and all kinds of riddles. You see, God wants us to grow. But if anger gets in the way, well, that's not good. I mean, just listen to what Peter had to say about this. He wrote, do your best to improve your faith. You can do this by adding goodness, understanding, self-control, patience, devotion to God, concern for others, and love. If you keep growing in this way, it will show that what you know about our Lord Jesus Christ has made your lives useful and meaningful. But if you don't grow, you are like someone who is nearsighted or blind. You have forgotten that your past sins are forgiven. You see, after doing everything we can do, if anger still causes us to get stuck in the past or prevents us from growing into the future... That's when we may need help. And to whom should we go for help? Our second question. Well, I think there are two qualities we should probably look for. And the order you place them is really up to you. I mean, first, I believe they should have the skills and the experiences in dealing with this kind of stuff. Now, this may mean going to a counselor who's been trained to help folks like us. But it may also mean talking to people who've been through the same kind of thing we're facing. Of course, these two options aren't mutually exclusive. And this idea of seeking out people who are skilled, well, it's firmly grounded in the Bible. For example, in the Old Testament, when the children of Israel were building a special tent where they could worship God, now it had to be a tent because they were moving all over the place in the wilderness. They did it for 40 years. Moses told the people of Israel, that the Lord had said, if you have any skills, you should use them to help make what I have commanded. And as Paul wrote to the Romans, I realize how kind God has been to me. And so I tell each of you not to think you are better than you really are. Use good sense and measure yourself by the amount of faith that God has given you. A body is made of many parts and each of them has its own use. That's how it is with us. There are many of us, but we each are part of the body of Christ, as well as part of one another. God has also given each of us different gifts to use. If we can prophesy, we should do it according to the amount of faith we have. If we can serve others, we should serve. If we can teach, we should teach. If we encourage others, we should encourage them. If we can give, we should be generous. If we are leaders, we should do our best. If we are good to others, we should do it cheerfully. When we're looking for someone to help us, I think we need to consider their skills and experiences. That's one. But I also believe we need to find someone we 
trust. You know, who'll offer support, we'll receive, and advice will follow. Of course, these people are important in every aspect of life. For example, just listen to what the writer of Ecclesiastes said. He wrote, you are better off to have a friend than to be all alone. Because when? Because then you will get more enjoyment out of what you earn. If you fall, your friend can help you up. But if you fall without having a friend nearby, you are really in trouble. If you sleep alone, you won't have anyone to keep you warm on a cold night. Someone might be able to beat, one, beat up one of you, but not both of you. As the saying goes, a rope made of three strands of cord is hard to break. Now that's what he wrote, and I think we'd all agree that trust is involved in every genuine friendship. And I'll tell you, it's certainly involved with the people we let help us. I mean, let's get real. Skill and experience ain't worth a bucket of spit if we've already decided that we would rather trust our own distorted view of reality, that reality that's shaped by the anger and the bitterness and the resentment we feel than the guy we're talking to. For him to help us, not only do we need to believe we need help, I mean, duh, we also need to believe that he's the one who can do the job. And for that reason, I think it's appropriate to follow the advice of John when we're deciding who deserves our trust. He wrote, Dear friends, don't believe everyone who claims to have the Spirit of God. Test them all to find out if they really do come from God. Many false prophets have already come out into the world, and you can know which ones come from God. His Spirit says that Jesus had a truly human body. But when someone doesn't say this about Jesus, you know that person has a spirit that doesn't come from God and is an enemy of Christ. You knew that this enemy was coming into the world and now is already here. I'll tell you, if we're serious about getting help, we should find someone who's both skilled and trustworthy, just so long as we remember that whether or not we trust a person is our, always our decision. It's up to us. And so there you have it, how we might better manage our anger. But like I just said about trust, whether or not we do anything, anything, is still up to us. God isn't going to force us to do it. We have to decide. And when we do, not only will it help, but it just might make it easier to do it again. Because I'm afraid for most of us, anger is just a recurring part of life. But on those occasions when we don't and we give in to temptation and when we let anger control us, not because we think it's the right thing to do, because it happens. We're weak. We're human. I think it's crucial that we remember that Jesus came to save sinners and that our eternal destinies are secure in God's loving and merciful hands and that's true whether we manage our anger or not. Amen.